Welcome to Green is Good, raising awareness of each individual's impact on the environment and helping to create a more beautiful and sustainable world. Now, here's John Shigarian, Chairman and CEO of Electronic Recyclers International, and Mike Brady. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome to Green is Good. And Mike, it is just great to see you. You had a little break in between, and it's just nice to see you back again. Yeah, it's good to see you too, my friend. It was nice to take a little bit of time off. Of course, the show continues on, but it is good to be back in the saddle and uh, do what we can to inform, entertain, and empower our audience when it comes to taking better care of our planet and uh, reminding everyone that green is good on a couple of levels, not only for the environment, but for our wallets as well. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, I'm going to tell you, since we've seen each other in the last, we haven't seen each other in about a week or so, I made a fun discovery. And this is not a commercial, obviously. They're not a sponsor of the show. But I was flipping through the, what, four or 500 cable channels we have now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, something a lot different than when we were growing up. Yep. And um, uh, channel 201 is... Uh, the it's like a, a all green channel. Oh, I know what you're talking about, yeah. and I, I find myself because just like maybe as a research base uh, yeah. to start, but boy, oh boy, there's some great stuff on that. Oh, it is wonderful, and I and there's, there's some great shows on there, and it's just it's more and more inspiring that other folks are putting the good word out there, like you and I are trying to do, and. Uh, it's just fun. It's on the it's on the local Comcast two hundred and one uh, channel, and 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 it just uh, I'm seeing all sorts of great stories that I know we're going to have those folks on our show one day. Well, I'm looking forward to that, and we've got a great guest today. Oh, we have actually one of the legends of the of the green industry. Um, we have uh, Andrew Winston, who wrote one of the seminal books on the on the coming and now the current green revolution he wrote green to gold he has a new book that's coming out in the next i think couple of weeks he's going to tell us about that why don't we get andrew on the line and let him tell the story of why green is good to him andrew winston we are so honored to have you on green is good today andrew you're one of the guys who really started the whole green revolution with your seminal book green to gold welcome to green is good and tell us what's going on now in the green revolution well thanks john thanks for having me and i I appreciate that I, i hesitate to say that i started the revolution i think i you know reported on it or or caught some of the the themes that were going on but they're have been companies and people working on this for for many many years, uh, and I think you know that has continued. Uh, you know, we're, we're in hard economic times, and there's certainly companies that are pulling back. But some of the leaders, uh, some of the old old leaders, the ones who have been doing it for decades, like Dupont or 3M, and some of the newer newer modern leaders like Walmart and GE, they're continuing and they're accelerating their sustainability efforts and realizing it's a it's a great chance to take the lead in their marketplace as others maybe are pulling back. I think there's there's plenty of companies that are very happy to see their competitors slowing down on their green efforts. Hey, Andrew, our listeners always love to know when our great guests have you know caught the bug. Were you were you a childhood greenie, or did you catch it somewhere during college, or when did you get the green bug? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I guess I, you know I'm, I'm sort of late to the game on on some level in, in my personal life. I you know I was not born and raised a greenie. I wasn't you know camping and going out there and hugging trees a lot. Um, although my three-year-old just went up and hugged a tree recently, and I didn't even have to get him, I didn't even have to, get him to do it. He, uh, he just went. I said, what are you doing? He said, hugging a tree, as if that was just so obvious. And, uh, you know, just because he felt like it. But, uh, you know, I, I was working in, in the business world for, you know, over a decade and was doing strategy work at, you know, big consulting firms and like BCG and, and then in, in media companies doing strategy, marketing, business development kind of jobs. And uh, after the dot-com crashed, you know, I found myself thinking about what I really wanted to do next. And uh, was personally interested in the environment and had you know been a vegetarian for many years, uh, which I had done mainly out of resource concerns, just you know from the logic of boy, this uses a lot of resources to eat. Um, you know, higher on the food chain, and uh, it didn't seem to make sense to me. And I was changing light bulbs and sort of driving my wife crazy and decided that I wanted to find a way to combine business and environment and see how I could apply what I'd been doing to this environmental challenge. And it you know, was sort of a journey that started about nine, ten years ago. Um, and I ended up going back to school and getting a degree in environmental management at Yale to try to match the MBA I had and the business work I had. So I really had no... 
you know, training before that point on, on green. So my, my take is always as a business person, you know, how do we talk about this as a business problem and a business opportunity, which I, which I think it is, and I think it's probably the greatest business opportunity we've ever seen. Well, you know, when, when, we, when, when we started Electronic Recyclers, your book, Green to Gold, was literally one of the first books I bought at Barnes & Noble to try to understand what this whole greening of the, the universe, America, the revolution really meant. When did you write that book, and were you excited and surprised by the success that you did have with that book? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I spent three years basically full-time you know, writing that book. I, I graduated from the, the program at Yale in 2003, and I had been talking to uh, my co-author, uh, Dan Esty, who's a professor there, uh, about doing some work, you know, after graduation. And we, we decided while I was there that, you know, maybe a book would be a good idea to, to really go out and review what was, what was happening. So, I, you know, I, I took a full-time position as a consultant to the university, um, drawing a sort of minor salary from some money we had raised to spend time doing this. And, you know, it was something that we thought would take maybe a year, maybe a year and a half. And I ended up spending three, you know, from 03 to 06 doing, a couple years of research on the road, talking to lots of different companies and lots of people within those companies in, in, in many different positions to understand what was working and what wasn't working in this quest for, for greening the business. Uh, and then I've spent the last three years, the book came out almost three years ago, you know, I spent the last three years, you know, doing a great deal of evangelizing and, and, and speaking and, and writing about how green is good for business and how it makes perfect business sense um, and doing consulting, you know, working with mostly large companies on their, their strategies and developing their approaches. Well, and so then what was the impetus, what was the segue, the bridge from green to gold now to your new book that's coming out, I think, next week? And I've already seen uh, a copy of it, and it's, it's unbelievable and so relevant. But what was the bridge? What brought you from green to gold to green recovery? And what does that mean in, in where we are in, the, in this whole, uh, in the cycle that we're in right now, this whole green revolution that seems to have washed over the whole country? Right, right. I, you know, green recovery came about uh, very, very quickly. I mean, it, it came about obviously when the economy started to, to turn down. And I, you know, I, I've been writing regularly for a number of different outlets, and I, I write some columns for Harvard Business Online. And one of the editors there, uh, you know, I wrote some pieces at the end of 2008 about, you know, what to, ex- what to expect in 09 and, and the things I thought were going to continue uh, on this green movement. And one of the editors just, you know, emailed me and said, hey, you know, someone should probably write the story of, you know, what does it mean to go green in a recession or why does it still matter and, and what do you need to do about it? Um, and so I, I did that very quickly in, in the first couple months of this year. Um, you know, and then spent a little time editing, and it's you know coming out pretty fast as as books go, um, and it'll be out in the next week or two. And you know, green recovery is is really about how to go green in, in hard economic times, and it, and it focuses on um, sort of the short term, the immediate uh, sense of what you need to do to get lean and save money right now, because I think. Uh, in the business world, uh, we've become very reliant over the last 10, 20 years on layoffs and, and, and just think, well, we'll cut labor. We'll just cut people. And, you know, granted, companies that are shrinking may need fewer people. That's, that's what happens. But I think we probably have relied on that too much, and I think it's time to get lean on stuff and not on people. And so I spent a, you know, a good chunk of the book on here are the things companies are doing in a few key business areas that save money very fast, that have quick ROI, so you can save money and, and save capital. And then the, the rest of the book is, you know, what do you do with that capital that you've saved, and not just for survival, but how do you, you know, reinvest in your people and in innovation to get ready for the upturn and get ready to, to hopefully dominate your market, marketplace when we come out of this and growth resumes. Well, well that's a great, that's a great uh, tagline, get lean on stuff, not on people. We love to give our listeners, and we asked our guests to give our listeners some little tips. So are there five areas that you want to just share with our listeners out of green recovery uh, to inspire them that businesses can get lean in and save money on fast? Like, do you have right. like a top five? Yeah, the, the, the five areas that I focus on, and, you know, I asked a bunch of companies that I work with and, and know well and said, you know, where do you see the, the paybacks the quickest? And, and the five areas are, are basically facilities, which is, you know, heating and cooling and lighting. And there's a tremendous amount going on with, with things as simple as just changing the light bulbs, you know. And all of, all of what I'm going to say sounds really obvious, but 
you know, very few companies are doing all of these things. They're sort of known quantities to some extent, but we've gotten much better at them in the last few years. There's been a lot of innovation and experimentation on how to get lean, and the technologies have been getting better and cheaper to use. You know, there's better and better lighting that's cheaper to, to put in place that saves you money sometimes within a month or two, you know, very quickly. So, you know, the first, the first group is, is facilities, uh, then IT, information technology. There's a tremendous amount of effort going on now on how do we save money in data centers. Uh, fleets, you know, trucks and distribution, there's a lot of innovation going on there. Uh, the, the whole category of telework or telecommuting, using technology to not fly around and, and see each other when we don't need to. And then waste, which you know, is not necessarily a huge money saver, but it's, it, you can turn something that's maybe a cost center into a small profit center if you find ways to, you know, drastically reduce waste. And you can do it quickly in, in many cases. And it's a great way to, to change your mental model, you know, change the way you look at your business. And, and I think that fits, obviously, with recycling and sort of closing the loop, right? Yeah, and we have, yeah, it does. It does really well. And we have about a minute before we go to break. So I just want to ask you, so in Green Recovery, you give great examples that, that people who read your book can get inspired by and, and, and follow these, these first five tips you just laid out there so they can implement them in business and save money also. That's right, and save money quickly. I mean, every example in that part of the book uh, has a payback of less than two years, quite often less than a year. And this is the timeline we're on. You know, we're in this, we're in this recession. We need to save money as quickly as possible, and we can do it. And this is the you know, the proverbial low-hanging fruit, well, this is what, you know, the energy guru, Amory Lovins, calls the, the fruit on the ground. And that's, that's what we're really talking about here. <laughs> fruit doesn't hang any lower than that, does it, Andrew? <laughs> no, not at all. It's, it's as low as it gets, and, and it's, you know, the $20 bill laying on the factory floor. Well, there's actually thousands of them laying around. We're discovering that more and more. We think we're lean, and we think we're as lean as we can get, and then we keep finding ways to, to get better at it. Hey, perfect. We're going to go and take a break to our green sponsors, and we're going to come back with Andrew Winston and talk more about his new book, Green Recovery. If a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Hey, welcome back to Green is Good. We've got Andrew Winston on the phone today. And Andrew was recently named the Planet Defender by Rock the Earth. We are honored, Andrew, to have you on. You truly are living proof that Green is Good. We're thrilled to have you on and to talk about both your your, your previous book, Green to Gold, and your new book, which is coming out next week, that people can buy on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, Borders, and anywhere else they can buy books, The Green Recovery. Andrew Winston, thanks for being on Green to Good today. John, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Well, listen, I want to, you know, just, you know, we run a company, Electronic Recyclers, and, and the whole green, we recycle for a living, so obviously we're doing green stuff. But for companies out there that are listening to the show – today. Tell us why the green revolution, the green movement is really here to stay, just like good accounting practices and Sarbanes-Oxley. Why is being green here to stay and not just a fad that's going to go away? Well, yeah, it's interesting. I think people, maybe some companies would hope that it's going to go away because it, it represents so much change. And I think it's, you know, it's a great opportunity for companies, but change, you know, change can be hard. So, Often people hope that it's going away, but the, you know, the, the underlying pressures, the reasons companies are going green are not going anywhere. And, and there's some, you know, there's some underpinning reasons like real environmental challenges, you know, real changes in the world's climate, in, in the availability of resources, real constraints. And, you know, you're seeing companies deal with things like water shortages in different parts of the world. The, you know, these are real environmental challenges that we have to face. But again, it's, you know, these are opportunities for the companies that can solve these problems. But there's also this pressure from all these different kinds of stakeholders, all these people that surround your company or or are on the inside, your own employees, your customers, your consumers, uh, the communities around you. The questions are getting louder and and more diverse and and much clearer, Uh, and they're asking for higher standards. They're asking for companies to do more for the environment and do more socially. And, you know, just just to take a couple of those, you know, the biggest example, I think, are the the customer base, you know, business-to-business customers, huge companies asking their suppliers very tough questions and making them go green. And and the quintessential example there is Walmart. And Walmart, you know, is the biggest company in the world, uh, biggest retailer in the world, and they are pressuring every one of their suppliers to reduce packaging, to reduce fossil fuel use, and just 
set a new set of regulations uh, in South America, for example, where everyone there that supplies them can no longer supply beef or soy or other things that damage the Amazon rainforest. So they're reaching back pretty far into their supply chain and affecting these huge environmental issues, and it's changing the way business is done around the world. So this is totally unavoidable now. You know, I think there is no alternative, and that's a, a phrase that some executives at Shell Oil have been using for years. They, they, they use this acronym, TINA, there is no alternative. And they say this is a, an issue we can't avoid, so we might as well compete on it. And there's, a good, there's good news. You can compete on it, and you can make a lot of money doing it. And so you're saying you're, you're, you're putting forward then that it's good for the bottom line. Green is good for not only business practices and marketing, but it's also good for the bottom line. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, another common perception is that it's just for PR, if it's just for marketing. And certainly there's benefits there to, to be able to tell a story that's legitimate and verifiable and measurable and not just what, you know, what some people call greenwashing. If you have something real to, to say, and a product that, that does something that lowers environmental impacts, then, yeah, you should market it, and marketing's fine. It's great to create marketing and brand value, but it also creates some really tangible value in reducing costs to the bottom line and driving new revenues, in reducing risk to your business. All these things are measurable and, and very large scale. These are not small numbers. There are companies saving literally billions of dollars uh, in reduced costs just from getting more eco-efficient. You know, Mike and I always talk about the three tenants of sustainability, people, planet, and profits. And I know you're focused on the people aspect also of the green movement. Tell us what are three things that every employee should know to get ready, to get a company ready for the future in terms of bringing them into the process, co-opting them into the the green revolution and into the solution. Right, right. I think you know, from the people side, I, I you know I focus on corporate strategy, so I'm thinking about how do you get your people engaged? How do you how do you get them excited about this? Uh, you know, they will be a force uh, on the company no matter no matter what you do, and they're going to pressure the company. But they need to be better educated about what are these environmental trends, what are these forces, and how do we innovate to to deal with them? Now, I, I've boiled it down in, in green recovery to just you know sort of three principles that I, I feel like if every employee had some sense of these. Your, your company will get leaner, greener, and more profitable very fast. Uh, and, and the first one is one that uh, you know, I think causes a lot of debate amongst people, and it's about climate change. And it's just this idea that climate change is now a political and business reality, and it doesn't matter what you think about the scientific reality. There is now an, enough momentum in the business community. Companies representing trillions in sales and revenue have come out and said, we want legislation on climate change, we want a cap on carbon, and the governments of the world are moving. And 190 countries are going to get together in, in Denmark this year and talk about a climate treaty. And they're going to do something. And there's going to be action. And there's already a climate bill that passed in the House here. So this is now a political and business reality. And you have to deal with that fact. It means that energy will be more expensive, carbon will be more expensive, and it will affect how business is done in every industry, in every business, because it will affect the cost of doing business. So that's you know, sort of the first principle. Okay. And, you know, and the others are related to that. You know, one is that resources are not infinite. You know, that sounds sort of obvious, but it's not the way we've operated for our entire history as a species. It's very hard for us to deal with, but we're hitting constraints. And then the, the third principle is that, you know, business and, and environmental benefits are about the full value chain. It's not about just what happens within your walls, within your company, but what your suppliers do, what your customers do, and that end-of-life thing that leads to, you know, recycling and waste management and all those, all those good things. Right, right. So in the book, people can see how you lay those uh, those three items out and how they can bring their employees into the process. That's right. That's so, right. I think there's different ways to engage people at different levels and sort of different aspects of their lives. You, you talk to them as people about their about their personal lives, and there's a lot of that going on in companies about how people can green their own lives and save money in their homes and how they drive to work and all of those things. And you talk to them about the things they can do around the office, and, and there's a lot of excitement these days for having green teams and companies to do things like get rid of, you know, plastic water bottles in the, in the office or, you know, get to two-sided copying, those kinds of things. But I think the, the third level is really about the business itself, the strategy, the products, the processes. And that's where, you know, I get excited and where the real value is, is how do you get everybody engaged and talk to them about greening the business itself, about how they, how they make things, how they procure things, how they talk to customers and what they do for customers. That's going to have the biggest impact of all. 
So, you know, one of your chapters is called Get Creative, and it's about disruptive, heretical, green innovation and getting to the future first. What do you mean by that? And what and what are people supposed to take away from what you mean by get creative? I want our listeners to understand what does that mean and heretical green innovation. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's easy to say to people, hey, you got to get lean, you got to save money. But I think people forget that some of those tactical things also take creativity. We need to be creative about how we do things. And so there's, create, you know, there's creativity and innovation in some, in some of the simple things, how we light our buildings and how we, how we operate in the processes. But there's also creativity in a, in a much larger sense where you start to ask deeper questions about the business and about what you do for customers. And you ask sometimes heretical questions. You know, the example I use is, you know, I got this idea, the germ of this idea from working with a Boeing company. And they've been doing test flights with a bunch of different airlines that check the idea of whether they even need fossil fuels to fly the plane. They're asking this heretical question, and they were joking in a meeting about, oh, this is sort of heresy. We should do a project heresy. And they were kidding, and I said, no, that's a great idea. Companies need to do that systematically, get together and say, what's our heresy? Can we fly without jet fuel? Can we operate without fossil fuels? Can we operate without using any water? Can we operate without any toxicity? And, and many other kinds of questions that may not be attainable in the short term, but it set goals and set, set you in motion and can create a new idea of what the business is even about. You know, that really is a radical concept yeah. when you talk about it. <laughs> and, and I think the term heretical is a perfect one, Andrew, because, I mean, when you think about air travel, for example, or any kind of transportation, uh, one of the immediate things we think about are fuel costs, right. because that is a given. You need fuel to to operate your fleet of vehicles, your fleet of aircraft, your fleets at sea, or do you? Right. That's where the heresy comes from, and that starts a whole new chain of events. Right. I mean, I think nobody would have thought in recent years, hey, can we fly without jet fuel? But now there's more and more investment going into new kinds of fuels based on algae and things that seemed ridiculous not that long ago. And it doesn't mean they'll get there immediately. Uh, you know, one of my favorite stories in, in green recovery, and it's sort of the, the one I spend the most time on, it's the longest story in the book, is about a, a small American company that makes cleaning machines for floors, you know, the kinds you see janitorial services pushing around on, like, marble floors and malls and things. Sure. And they, you know, figured out a way, instead of using chemicals in water, which is how every machine has always worked, they figured out a way to use just tap water. And it's, you know, it's sort of a basic technology that's been around for years and years in other settings. And someone in the company started asking different questions and said, can we clean the floor without chemicals? Wow. And they found a way to do it. And, you know, it's a company called Tenants based in Minneapolis. And it's a really incredible story to me. It's the kind of innovation we're going to see. It doesn't seem exciting, but it can happen anywhere. It can happen in any industry, and it's really shaking up the cleaning industry. Well, you know, you, you bring up a good point, too, and how that all came about. Uh, one of my favorite uh, sayings is that it's really that the questions are the hard part. The answers come easy. It's just learning what questions to ask and how to ask the right questions. That's right. That's right. And I think opening yourself up to new ideas, you know, part of what happened to Tenant was the CEO came in and said, hey, we're going to be an environmental cleaning company now. Go figure out what that means. You know, and some of the R&D guys were in Japan and saw that in hospitals they were cleaning wounds for, for decades with this ionized water, just water, because it was wounds. You couldn't use chemicals. And they just said, why can't we do that on the floor? And, you know, 18 months wow. later, they had a working prototype, and they were working with customers, and it was, it, was on, you know, it was on the way out the door. So, you know, it's an amazing thing when you open yourself up to, the, to these kind of questions and different ideas and, and change the discussion entirely about what your company's about and what your industry does. Hey, you know, we've talked about getting lean. We've talked about getting creative, all from your new book, Green Recovery. Talk about getting smart, companies getting smart, and give us some more great examples. Like you've already told us about the water solution, Boeing, Walmart. What other companies are inspirational that we know as brands today or maybe new brands that are emerging that, are, that really get it and are really helping to change the earth but also making great money and profits at the same time? Yeah, getting smart is, is one of those sort of – geeky sides of this that I find really fun, and, and, and it's, you know, for some people who really enjoy numbers, it can be great. There's just more and more uh, knowledge out there about what your environmental impacts are, what your footprint is, and there's more demands, again, from those customers and all those stakeholders to say, hey, what is your footprint? 
So there's, there's a, a real benefit to knowing more about your business. I mean, that seems sort of obvious, and the tools are getting better, you know, the ways to capture information and to analyze it. And the companies that I think get there first, that really understand their footprint up and down their value chain, are going to be able to do a bunch of things that their competitors won't. They're going to save a lot of money because they're going to find where they're, where they're fat, where they're, you know, wasting a lot of energy and, and, and resources. But they're going to also be able to innovate. And, and one little story that I love is, is P&G or Procter & Gamble. They make, you know, detergent and they make Tide. And they realize, looking at their numbers, by doing the analysis that the biggest part of the energy use in their detergents was not within their own control, not their manufacturing, but the energy use comes in the using it in the washing machine. And most of that comes from heating the water. So they made Tide cold water. They, you know, they invented a product to say, hey, to the customers at home, you don't have to heat the water. You can set it to cold, and it will clean just as well. That saves everybody money. You don't have to heat the water. And that's just one example. I mean, there are companies doing a great deal more with this information. Once you understand your impacts by product, by store, by whatever division of your company you have, you can assess what's going to happen when there's higher energy prices, when there's a price on carbon, which is going to happen with all this regulation coming. And it changes the way you do business, the kinds of products you might decide to make or sell, where you sell them. And it allows you to you know, outcompete the, the rest of the people on the playing field and I think operate at a higher margin at lower cost and drive sales in a, in a new way. Hey, so really our listeners, what the takeaway from that great story is, is P&G creates Tide for cold water. We could all wash our clothes in cold water now in a great product like Tide or another great product and save the energy at home. That's right. I think, you know, that's sort of a simple at-home uh, kind of thing to do. And I think, you know, it leads you to some more interesting kind of heretical questions, which is, well, you know, <laughs> do we need to wash the clothes when we do? And maybe there's products that are going to help you wash less or fabrics that are going to help you wash less. Or do we need to dry them? And, and more and more people are going back to hanging their, their wash out on the, on the, you know, wires out on the lawn and saying, why do I even need to use energy to dry my clothes? And you, you know, know what? That is really amazing yeah. because I've seen that in my own neighborhood, Andrew, and you're absolutely right. I mean, Anything that, that people can do like that, it's not only just good and sound environmental business, but, you know, saving money when you don't have to use hot water. Hey, when you don't have to use the dryer at all, that's even better. That's right. And I think, you know, this kind of, act, this kind of use of data that companies do, people can do it at home. And, and, again, there's more and more tools. There are these home meters that don't cost a lot that let you see how much energy you use. And they've done studies, and people who use these meters, they generally reduce their energy use 10 to 20% just because they have the meter. It makes them realize the light's still on or that they're, you know, using the washing machine or that they're doing something they don't need to do quite yet. And they save money just, just from seeing the data, just from having the information. And I think people can do that in their own home. Andrew, you're, you're, you're really uh, inspirational to all of us. Do you have one or two more tips that people could do at their home to save money, save energy, save the planet before we got to go and, and say goodbye today? Well, I think it's, you know, it's the classic simple things you can do to save the earth. I think what you do in your house with, with lights is, is you know, the easiest thing in the world. Turning off the lights when you leave the room, it seems so obvious, but people don't do it. Not leaving you know, the TV on in the other room. I mean, those right. things, those flat screen TVs we all love that use a lot of energy. You know, <laughs> washing your, your clothes when you have full loads, washing your dishes when you have full loads. Uh, and, you know, and the biggest things you can do are, you know, are what you drive, you know, and how big your house is. There's some bigger decisions that, <laughs> that you know, are a part of what your footprint is. And I think what you drive and how much you drive, uh, are, you know, is one of the biggest things you can do. So, I, I, you know, I encourage people as they are at some point getting a new car, to think about the hybrids if they haven't gotten one yet. There's more and more options of all different sizes, and I think that's one of the main things you can do to, to, to help reduce your impact. Well, Andrew, we thank you so much for spending time today on our show, and we're going to ask you to come back at another date, but we want your book to be a, a great success because you deserve it, and your, and your thoughts and your leadership are inspirational. I want all our listeners to go out and buy Green Recovery by Andrew Winson. If it, you could go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Borders, or a bookstore near you, and if anyone wants to learn more about Andrew Winston, you could go to www.andrewwinston.com. Andrew, you are living proof that green is good.